Hey, it's Sam from Sugar Spun Run, and today we are making a snickerdoodle cake. This cake was so much fun to develop. I was very particular about making sure we get that classic snickerdoodle tang. It has a beautiful ripple of cinnamon and sugar swirled throughout the crumb. Let's go ahead and jump right into it by preheating our oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. You'll need a large mixing bowl to start. Alternatively, you could make this recipe in the bowl of your stand mixer. Today, I'm just going to be using my electric hand mixer instead. Now you'll need three and a third cups of cake flour. And I do prefer cake flour for this recipe, but I will make sure to include notes just in case you only have all purpose flour in your kitchen. We're also going to be adding two cups of granulated sugar to the bowl. If you've been baking with me for a while, you will recognize that this means we are going to be doing the reverse creaming method today instead of traditional creaming. I've been using this technique a lot lately. I really like the crumb it provides. I'll talk about that more in a bit. We're also going to be adding a tablespoon of baking powder. That is not a typo, one tablespoon. And of course we need a little bit of salt. We'll be adding three fourths teaspoon of table salt today. All right, now whisk everything together until these ingredients are well combined. You want that sugar, flour, baking powder to be well distributed. Next, you're going to need one half cup of softened unsalted butter. I actually accidentally pulled out two sticks. I'm going to need the other one for the frosting later. We're just going to be using one of these sticks for the cake. So we're going to be doing the reverse creaming method, which means we're going to be adding the butter in a slightly different way than you may be used to. We are going to start by adding just one tablespoon of butter. Now grab your mixer, electric mixer or stand mixer, and we're going to stir this butter in until it is completely combined into the dry ingredients. It shouldn't take very long. So once that tablespoon is all broken up and dissolved into your dry ingredients and sugar, we'll add another tablespoon and we'll stir this in. And then we're just going to continue adding one tablespoon after another until all of the butter has been added. At first, it's going to seem like not much is happening, but that butter should be getting worked in. And eventually we're going to have a sort of sandy mixture. I'll show you exactly what the texture should look like. If you are using a stand mixer, you will want to pause occasionally, scrape the sides and bottom of the bowl, just because you wanna make sure everything is getting evenly incorporated. So with many cake recipes, you may be used to combining the butter and sugar and beating those until they are well creamed or light and fluffy. That's the traditional creaming method. But I have been having a moment with this method. Traditional has its place, I still use it all the time. But when you do the butter this way, when you incorporate it this way, you coat the gluten strands a little bit differently. And what happens is you end up with a crumb that is just, it's tighter but it's more plush and sometimes it is a little bit more moist too. It just has a more melt in your mouth feel. A little more velvety, I'd say. I don't know, I'm not much of a wordsmith when it comes to food, unfortunately. So another reason I like this reverse creaming method is with traditional creaming, you always have to be very careful that you don't accidentally overmix the dry and wet ingredients when you're combining them. When you do it this way, there is so much less risk of accidentally overdoing it and overmixing can cause a dense dry cake. We are really eliminating a lot of that risk here. Let's add our last tablespoon of butter. Ooh, oh my goodness. Oh my gosh, look at all the butter we almost wasted. You guys know we do not waste butter around here. I take this very seriously. Also, have you been to the grocery store recently? It's not cheap. All right, remember we are just using one of those sticks because it's just a half cup of butter in today's recipe. Let's stir in this last tablespoon. All right, and let's take a look at that crumb. You can see it's a pretty dry, sandy mixture. You shouldn't have any very large lumps of butter remaining. It should be nicely incorporated. And especially if you are using a stand mixer, you'll want to make sure that you scrape the sides and bottom of the bowl to make sure everything is combined. The next thing you're going to need is one half cup of a neutral cooking oil. You could use a vegetable oil or canola oil. Recently, I have been using avocado oil instead. I do like to use oil in addition to the butter because it makes the crumb more moist and tender. And also this cake is a cream cheese frosting, a soft cream cheese frosting. So I typically keep it refrigerated and adding oil will help keep a cake soft even when it's refrigerated. Now we're going to slowly drizzle this into our mixture. And I try to make sure that all of the flour is moistened by the oil. 
So it's going to look like a sort of wet, sandy mixture. This looks pretty good, no significant dry patches remaining. So we can set this aside. And in a separate bowl, or I just use a large measuring cup, you will need one and a third cups of buttermilk. I do prefer for this to be at room temperature before I use it. So to the buttermilk, we are going to add three large eggs. Again, these should also ideally be room temperature. Using ingredients that are all the same temperature is just going to help everything incorporate better. It's going to give you a more even batter. Also, you really should crack your eggs in a separate bowl just in case you get any shell in there. But um, I promise I'm just gonna be really careful today. All right. Three eggs. We're also going to add a teaspoon of vanilla extract right in here. And we are going to whisk these ingredients together. If I can find my whisk. That one's too big. We're just gonna whisk everything together until the eggs are nicely broken up and incorporated in with the buttermilk. One thing you might have noticed about this recipe is I have not yet put any cinnamon in the batter. That was an intentional choice. I tried this cake so many different ways, and when I put cinnamon into the cake crumb, it ended up being too much, actually, kind of weirdly. So we're gonna do a cinnamon sugar ripple instead, and then there's going to be cinnamon and sugar in the frosting as well. Okay. Egg is nicely incorporated there. Let's bring back our dry, ish ingredients, our butter and flour mixture. And we are going to, well, first remove our spatula. And we're going to gradually add the buttermilk mixture to our dry-ish ingredients. And I always just start with my mixer on low speed and we'll gradually turn that speed up once all of the buttermilk mixture has been incorporated. Okay, I'm turning my speed up just a little bit. I want to make sure the batter is nice and smooth. Everything's well combined. Now grab your spatula and do a nice scrape of the sides and bottom of the bowl. Make sure everything actually is well combined and there are no lumps of flour or butter hiding anywhere. You should have a nice, beautiful, smooth mixture. I love how silky and smooth that looks. All right, let's divide our cake into our cake pans. I did choose to make this a three layer cake. So you'll need three eight inch cake pans. Anytime I am baking a cake, I always, always cut out a parchment paper round and put that in the bottom. That is just extra insurance that your cake won't stick, which is just one of the saddest things that can happen when you're making a cake. I've also sprayed the sides with baking spray or you could grease and flour them. Now we're going to evenly divide the cake batter into the pans. If you want to use a scale to do this, you should be putting about 484 grams of batter into each pan. I should be using a scale. When I'm testing, I use a scale, but I don't know, something about on, being on camera just has me feeling extra bold, I guess. Bold and capable. Probably not ideal, but we'll see how it turns out. All the eyeballs on YouTube watching me right now, trying to gauge if I did a good job or not. We'll see. All right, I'm just going to spread this cake batter into the pan. Try to get it pretty even. I also wanna make sure I don't leave any batter behind. Don't like to waste this stuff. Also, if I leave it in the bowl, I'm just gonna end up eating it, so. Yeah, I have a problem, I know. Okay, one more step before we put these cakes in the oven is that cinnamon sugar ripple that I was telling you about. So a snickerdoodle needs cinnamon and sugar. So you just need three tablespoons of granulated sugar, two and a half teaspoons of ground cinnamon. And we're just going to quickly whisk these together. Now we'll sprinkle about a tablespoon of this mixture over each cake. Sorry if you can hear my husband working on his truck. Then you're going to take a butter knife and we are going to swirl this cinnamon sugar mixture into the cake batter. So don't overdo it or you won't have much of a swirl. I just kind of like to fold it over a couple times, if that makes sense. And then I'll use my knife to just sort of swirl it around. 
I don't want too much left on top. Some of it will sink in, but we're going to level the top. So if yours is just sitting on top, you'll lose a lot of that when you cut into the cake. I'll just smooth the top a little bit and I'll repeat with the rest of my cake layers. And don't stress about this too much because even if your swirl doesn't go exactly like you want it to, the cake's still gonna taste amazing. There, that's the best one I've done. This is how yours should look. So we'll take these over to our 350 degree Fahrenheit preheated oven, and they're going to need to bake for about 30 minutes. You will want to check each cake individually to make sure it's done because most ovens bake unevenly. My favorite way to tell that a cake is finished baking is I insert a toothpick in the center. If it comes out clean or preferably with some moist crumbs, I know it's done. We're going to let these cakes cool in their baking pan for about 10 minutes. Once the time has passed, grab yourself a butter knife and we're going to use this to just run it around the edge of the cake, just in case the cake's stuck, this will loosen it. Yours shouldn't have, but it's better to be safe than sorry. And remember the pans are going to still be hot at this point. And then we will carefully invert the cakes onto the cooling racks where they will need to cool completely before you can decorate them. And look how cleanly that came out of the pan. Parchment paper liners, don't skip them. So while the cakes are cooling, or once they've nearly cooled, we can go ahead and prepare our frosting. I chose to do a brown sugar infused cream cheese frosting for this recipe. It pairs so nicely with the cake. We're going to start with eight ounces of softened cream cheese, add half a cup of softened unsalted butter, and I mentioned that brown sugar infusion, we are also adding one fourth cup of firmly packed light brown sugar. Now grab your electric mixer and we'll cream everything together until it is smooth and well combined. And evidently I, oh, thought I unplugged it. I just don't know how to work it. First time in the kitchen. So once that's nicely combined, we are going to add just a pinch of table salt, which is going to help keep this frosting from being too sweet. It's an eighth teaspoon of salt, approximately. We'll also add a half teaspoon of vanilla extract and one teaspoon of ground cinnamon. Stir these in until they're nicely incorporated. And finally, we'll add our powdered sugar. This is three cups of powdered sugar. We're going to gradually add it to the frosting and I am going to do my best to be patient and stir it in on low speed. So hopefully I don't end up wearing any of the powdered sugar this time. What I think you're going to love about this frosting is it's not too sweet. It has a really nice subtle tang to it, which is what everyone really loves about snickerdoodles, whether they realize it or not. That's just what makes them classic. So I think this flavor balances the flavor of the cake really well. And I think it just really does have a signature snickerdoodle taste. All right, let's take a second to scrape the sides and bottom of the bowl. Make sure that everything is nicely incorporated. Now this frosting is inspired by my cream cheese frosting. It's probably obvious, but I use less sugar here. I only use three cups here, whereas I use four there. If you want to pipe this frosting, I'm going to be piping it some, but if you want to do a lot of decorative work with it, you'll probably want to add another cup of sugar. That will make it a lot sturdier. All right, I'll set this aside, but before we assemble our cake, I wanna to talk to you for just a second about leveling your cakes. The more cakes I decorate, the more I realize the importance of leveling your cake it really makes a difference in having a nice even cake. So real quickly, I'll show you how I level just one of the layers. I like to put it on wax paper just to catch any crumbs. I have this super inexpensive leveling tool. I will make sure to link to this. And then you just hold the cake stable and you very easily saw right through the top of the cake to give you a nice level surface. Otherwise you end up with a domed cake, a lopsided cake, just a little bit messier. Oh, and look, you can see all the pretty cinnamon sugar swirls in there. This is also a great opportunity to sample your cake and make sure it turned out properly. Mm. Which this one did. All right, let's assemble this cake. I always put a little dab of frosting on the bottom just to help the cake stick some. We'll place our first layer. Nice even layer of frosting on top of that. Next layer. And our final layer.
Now you can entirely decorate the whole outside of the cake, but because I want to do some more decadent dollops on top, I'm going to do a semi-naked layer on the outside, which means you'll be able to see some of the cake poking through. I really like this look for a cake. It's kind of rustic, it's simple, it's easy to do. And then we'll be adding a lot of frosting to the top of the cake, so this keeps it from being too much frosting all the way around. All right, the rest of our frosting is going to go into a piping bag, which I have fitted with the Attico 846 tip. The best way to fill a piping bag when you only have one set of hands is to put it in a large glass and have that hold it for you. And we'll go ahead and pipe those swirls on top. And this is a softer icing, so I make sure I keep the swirls at like 90 to 95% on top of the cake and not peeking over the edges any. Because this is a snickerdoodle cake, we got a little extra today and made some mini snickerdoodle cookies using my snickerdoodle recipe and like a teaspoon of dough each. We're just gonna add these to the top. Look how cute that is. All right, my favorite part, we're going to dig into this cake. And I'm so excited for you to see how it looks. And any snickerdoodle fans out there? Oh man, that's a big slice. I don't mess around with my cake. But any snickerdoodle fans out there, I really am excited for you to try this one at home. Take a look at that. We have a beautiful soft crumb, those beautiful cinnamon sugar ripples. I really am so excited for you to try this one at home. If you do, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. I really do always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. <laughs> this is a good one. Mm. I have the best job on the planet. Another benefit of the... Re hey! Goodness, they're making a ton of noise. Like, why is everyone screaming? We are going to, oh, oh, the oven is off.